I got a request from a student to do some unpacking of chapter 11, number 25. So the reason why this question does need quite a bit of unpacking is that it's probably one of the more uh, complicated questions for the homework because there's a lot of setup. But the main point of this type of problem is for you to consider models and the data that create models and then the data that refines models over time. So I picked this problem and parts of it. I only picked C and G for us to do. And the reason why I picked this problem is because I thought it was really important to think about the fact that we have models to explain biological phenomenon. And from day one, you keep hearing fluid, fluid mosaic model for the plasma membrane or biological membranes and cells. Fluid mosaic, fluid mosaic. It's like, shut up already. I, um, I hear you, fluid mosaic model. You take it for granted. So I really like this problem because it reminds you that we didn't always think that the fluid mosaic model was the model that described biological membranes. People had different ideas, and data was gathered to suggest different models. And you know, if more data comes out in the future, this model might be adjusted. So the setup of this problem talks about how when the fluid mosaic model was presented in 1971, the paper that presented it talked about the three most popular models at the time. And so in this problem, they're labeled A, B, and C. And in A, one model that people thought that the biological membranes look like was that you'd have a layer of protein, and then you'd have your lipid layer, and then you'd have your layer of protein. Another model which they represent in our problem as B is that the proteins are globular and the membrane is a protein-lipid mixture. So there's no lipid bilayer per se, and because I'm not a great artist, I say look at the Homer problem and I'm just going to draw this to represent <laughs> model B. Okay, and then model C is the lipid globular protein mosaic model. So this is what we know today as the fluid mosaic model. You've got a lipid bilayer and like a mosaic, proteins are embedded in the bilayer. So hopefully this is helping you unpack this problem. This is setting up the scenario. People had three different models at the time to explain what they think biological membranes look like. So then the next part of the problem is you cruise down to part C and part G. And I only picked those two because I, I felt like they were the clearest and most relevant for us. So the problem, this problem is asking you now, look at each piece of data in A through G, and I'm saying only look at C and G. But each of these items is a piece of data, and it's saying, how do these pieces of data apply to each model? And this is just a very real scientific thing that you'd do. If you were um, a biochemist that was studying biological membranes, you'd get a piece of data, and then you'd compare it to the different models at the time to see if your data was compatible or incompatible, or how you would adjust the model to explain the data that you observed. So in Part C, the piece of data they want you to consider is that Singer um, wrote in this article that the average amino acid composition of soluble proteins, so these are proteins that are chillin free and they're not in a membrane. These have the same amino acid composition as membrane proteins. 
he did not find a difference between the amino acids that make up free-floating proteins and the proteins that are embedded in a membrane. They're saying, he's saying that a substantial portion of the residues of either kind are hydrophobic. So then you take this piece of data and you compare it to each of the models. So you take this piece of data and look at model A. Now this piece of data doesn't quite work with model A per se because if the polar heads were keeping these proteins in place through ionic interactions, then you wouldn't have many hydrophobic residues in these proteins, would you? Also, if you have a whole layer of protein on either side of the lipid bilayer, you could think that this that it's probably this pretty thin layer of lipid bilayer. So where would the hydrophobic residues of these proteins have room to exist in? So the solution is saying the result is hard to reconcile with this model. This model would suggest that proteins that are bound to a membrane would have a high number of charged amino acids so that they could be stuck with ionic interactions to the polar heads. But that's not true. We see that the amino acid composition between soluble and membrane proteins is the same and they both have a lot of hydrophobic residues. Now this piece of data jives just fine with models B and C because both models B and C have membrane proteins that are in the lipid membrane so they would have parts that were hydrophobic as well as parts that were hydrophilic just like soluble membranes. The next piece of data I wanted you to look at is in part G. Singer describes a study in which a glycoprotein, so that's a protein that has a sugar attached to it, it has a molecular weight of about 31,000 and it's in human red blood cells in human red blood cell membranes. He says that scientists had done a treatment with trypsin. So he calls it a triptych treatment. But tri um, trypsin causes a particular result. Trypsin treatment of this protein as it sits in the membrane results in soluble glycoproteins that are about 10,000 in molecular weight and then the rest of what they find are very hydrophobic segments of protein. So remember, trypsin is a protease, and so with this protease treatment of this glycoprotein in a membrane, you get this result, 10,000 molecular weight pieces and a bunch of hydrophobic pieces. So what does that data mean? So the membrane is going to protect part of the protein from trypsin treatment. So if you had trypsin treatment, of this glycoprotein and it resulted in these two pieces, this is what happened. Trypsin comes and cuts here where it can access the protein. So that piece is your soluble piece. And then what the rest that you detect are hydrophobic portions that were not accessible to the trypsin. So that indicates a model that doesn't support A, 
because trypsin treatment would come in and just chew up the proteins because they're freely accessible. Model B isn't supported either because the proteins in Model B are all embedded within the lipid mixture and so they wouldn't be accessible to trypsin either. Only Model C makes sense with this piece of data because you have some of the protein that's exposed to trypsin and the part of the protein that's embedded in the lipid bilayer cannot be hit with the trypsin and so you detect it after trypsin treatment as just hydrophobic regions which you know now makes sense because those are the parts of the protein that are embedded in the nonpolar lipid bilayer. So hopefully this helped you unpack this kind of beastly problem. Note you wouldn't get something like this on an exam because it's a bit too beastly, but when you go through it on the homework, make sure you focus on the takeaway points of looking at data, comparing it to models, and helping you understand and refine the way you describe biological phenomenon.